Hello and welcome to The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. The shock from Donald Trump's November 8th presidential election victory is wearing off, but his policies will no doubt preoccupy much of the world as he begins to lay out his governing agenda. Trump's victory has amplified uncertainty across Asia. From China and Japan to the smaller nations of Southeast Asia, the region's leaders want to know whether Trump will make good on his campaign promises, which have the potential to shake up alliances and append the geopolitical map. Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has added a new dimension, saying Donald Trump showered praises on him and Pakistan during their telephonic conversation. In this context, that uh, we will discuss what Donald Trump means for Asia. Joining me on the program today are Bharat Bhushan, editor Catch News, Professor S.T. Muni, foreign affairs expert, Vivek Karchu, former ambassador, and Kapil Kark, Air Vice Marshal, retired defense expert as well. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador Karchu, I'd like to start with you, of course. Uh, you know, what uh, Sharif's claims, uh, you know, thus far, and also what he has said about the telephonic conversation, uh, many people are baffled about how he has given out the details of this conversation and also put into context for us what does this really mean as far as Asia is concerned, uh, as far as uh, Trump's presidency also is concerned. Link it together and put it in, in, into a picture for us. Well, in the first place, I think uh, the Pakistanis have been completely amateurish in putting out uh, segments of that conversation in uh, within courts. This is something that is never done. It's not part of usual diplomatic practice. In fact, it embarrasses uh, the interlocutor. And in this case, quite clearly, the uh, Trump team has been embarrassed because they have put out their own version which is very sober and uh, where they do confirm that uh, that Trump had indicated that he they, that uh, the his administration would want a strong relationship with Pakistan and that he would also want a strong bond with Nawaz Sharif the Pakistanis have gone too far uh, some sources in the Trump uh, team have said that they've gone too far in trying to indicate that Trump might uh, intervene in India-Pakistan issues. So that's one thing I think we can keep that aside. The second is that as far as Trump, the campaigner was concerned and Trump, the president-elect, my own feeling is that Trump, the president, as he evolves, may be quite different and that he may be uh, a little unconventional but may not stray too far away uh, from the basic principles which Im the American system has adopted and I carefully use this word the American system has adopted uh, for Asia as a whole in uh, we will naturally have to watch how he will play out how he will uh, respond to the rise of China but my own feeling is that uh, he will adopt a twin approach uh, he will want uh, to see that China is accommodated without losing American preeminence. That is, after all, what any American president would do. So we'll really have to wait and watch. And uh, we shouldn't take what Trump said during the election and what he's saying even now as a guide to future American policy under Trump administration. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Mr. Bushan, in the context of what Ambassador is saying, you know, how important is Asia really for Trump? Because right through his campaigning, he has said that, you know, he wants to uh, he wants to take up an isolationistic approach. He does not want to really deal with Asia. He said that on the first day that he takes office, he is going to do away with the TTP. Well, you, uh, you see, he's a person who's against alliances. Up to now, American foreign policy has worked with alliances. Alliances have been force multipliers for America's pushing its foreign policy interests. Here is a man who's against alliances, and his alliances in Asia, particularly with Japan and South Korea, will matter a lot because he has said during his campaign, maybe he doesn't mean it, but we'll have to take him at his word uh, uh, for the time being, where he has said that uh, he's not in favor of America uh, looking after the defense of Japan or of uh, South Korea. South Korea yes. Now, if this is what he really believes in, then that creates complications for a lot of other countries in the region, including India. As far as China is concerned, he has said he's, he, labels, he will label China as a currency manipulator and that he will impose steep tariffs on uh, China unless it rewrites all the trade agreements. 
Now, he's a businessman, so it's quite possible that he would do an economic deal with China. But would this free up greater strategic space for China to operate in the region? This, coupled with uh, what he's saying about his Asian alliances, could actually create uh, a lot of issues in this region as a whole. Now, we, our only hope is what uh, Vivek has been saying, that Trump, the president, would be different. Hmm. Because foreign policy in America is not made by the president alone. Hmm. Although uh, uh, Trump is a disruptor, and I believe he will disrupt the world order to some extent, but U.S. foreign policy is made by several institutions. Indeed. Indeed. That Pentagon is involved, State, State Department, of course, USTR is involved, the military industrial complex is involved, and business interests are involved. So how they impact on the disruptionist policies of Trump remains to be seen. You know, talking about these policies and talking about his team, he still hasn't, Professor, he still hasn't appointed a Secretary of State. And no one really knows much about Trump's foreign policy because he hasn't spoken much about it. So what's the approach that he's going to take? Well, you would recall that I said earlier we should look at President Trump differently from the candidate Trump. Hmm. And therefore, uh, one must be very cautious in drawing conclusion. I agree with both Bharat and Vivek on this point. There are two critical aspects of America's uh, Asia policy. One is strategic, another is economic. I don't think American economy today can withdraw from Asia unless they are prepared for uh, you know, hurting themselves very, very seriously. Secondly, in terms of strategic, much would be decided by what, uh, what you call the US-China equation emerges out to be. And I have heard many uh, uh, critical analysts saying that the Trump team is still uncertain as to how to deal with China. Hmm. Now, if they don't know how to deal with China, we cannot draw conclusions. But if he withdraws rebalance as a structure of policy, as a structure of strategy, it would obviously have implications. As Bharat said, if he really redefines uh, defense and security relationship with Korea and Japan, uh, we will have implications. But I, must, I might put a footnote here that uh, some <clears throat> element of redefinition started with Obama because he very clearly gave larger defense role to Japan. America is quite conscious that it cannot deal with China on its own and he would want its allies and that was the one of the corner stones of uh, the rebalance policy uh, to strengthen India, to, to let Japan play a larger defense role, to let Australia come in and see itself distance from China. All these were part of the continuing policy and I don't know to what extent they would be radically altered. If they are radically altered, well, we have to very carefully and seriously have concerns about what will happen in Asia. But if they are, uh, the structure remains the same and cosmetic changes are brought about in order to accommodate uh, what uh, Trump's promises were, I think we should carefully wait and see what these cosmetic changes are. Air Vice Marshal uh, Kark, I want to talk to you about, bring you back to the phone conversation between uh, Nawaz Sharif and uh, Donald Trump because what Nawaz Sharif said is completely con in contrast to what uh, Trump's team in fact came out and said. You know, but what I want to ask you is why is it that Western, uh, Western powers really are, you know, weak towards Pakistan? When it comes to Pakistan, we've seen time and again that they've shown some kind of weakness. No, that weakness is manifest in the way the Western world has looked at Pakistan ever since it was created. We need to understand Pakistan is a rentier state. Hmm. It's been a rentier state ever since its inception, first rented out to the United States. Subsequently, uh, from about 58, 60 onwards, proximity to China, and now virtually rented out to China. This is what decides the world's policies towards Pakistan. <coughs> I agree entirely with Vivek when he says, you know, this business of this conversation, I think we are overhyping it. We need to just forget about it. It's an irresponsible country which dishes out this stuff which has never been done diplomatically anywhere in the world. Merely to tell the world, particularly to signal India, that we are not alone, we are not isolated, Trump is going to be on our side. But fitting this part into the larger Asian framework, I'd like to suggest what Trump will do on which may happen, and the signs are already visible, is of unleashing a kind of a new volatility and uncertainty until the foreign policy and security policy of the United States administration from January 20th next year becomes somewhat clearer and more tangible. 
Why do I say this? As it is, there was uncertainty because China and Russia had formed up one, hmm. one part hmm. of a relationship in Asia as China started to grow and showed immense capability to project that power and its growth globally. Whether it's the Obor here, whether it's in Africa, whether it's Southeast Asia, anywhere in the world. Secondly, the Russia-Pakistan relationship has also shown some signs in the recent past. Although we are trying to reassure ourselves that Russia has been our traditional strategic partner for decades. But you see Russia possibly joining the Obor, the Russian bear, the famous language we used during the Cold War, ultimately seeking warm waters of the Indian Ocean through Gwadar, that has become a reality or could become a reality. And in a sense, this is also going to shape American policies towards Pakistan as also Afghanistan. I would not be surprised if despite his uh, isolationist policy, Trump actually does a slight surge in Afghanistan mm. uh, because he that gives us an opportunity not only to continue our economic uh, partnership with that country with some limited military help, but also ensure that Ashraf Ghani government remains stable even as uh, Afghan Taliban are now claiming that they have no problem in giving security to the TAPI pipeline or some of the major infrastructure projects like iron copper mm -hmm. mine. So I think this flux will, will remain and it is for us to evaluate very coolly without going too, ba too far back into the golden years of the Bush administration or the Obama administration in dealing with a new partner and a new set of issues right. which we'll have to confront. Most important of all, I think defense is one area where uh, what my colleagues have said so far uh, will actually fructify because that is not an area where Trump will do any changes. Okay. Because the fact that Ashton Carter is coming here uh, uh, this month and he's moving forward on the defense trade and uh, uh, you know other part, uh, uh, initiative, uh, Technology and Trade Initiative, right. DTTI, the help in India's uh, aircraft carrier project, the major one, which is a 65,000 tonner uh, follow up to the Indian aircraft carrier, which is 45,000 tons currently under construction. Uh, the prospect of uh, gas turbine technology coming to naval warships, 47 of them are under construction hmm, right hmm, now. Hmm, hmm. So the possibilities here of an improved relationship with the US are immense. Hmm. But I think we need to have a word of caution. There are sufficient indicators to believe that the pivot to Asia will come for a revision under Trump's policy, indeed, indeed. which will increase our security and defense challenges in South Asia, Fair particularly in the context of the Japanese and the South Koreans being asked to fend for themselves largely in defense matters. And Europe is already uh, up in arms because uh, France and Germany are signing uh, an agreement for 5 billion euro project so that they strengthen their defense sure. relations. Other countries have already moved forward and I think we need to be nimble in our uh, footwork in the US. Uh, recent statements that Foreign Secretary Jay Shankar was somewhat circumspect on his return from the US when he was sup supposedly testing the waters so even he doesn't seem to be so sure although Trump has been a great admirer with his numerous statements of, uh, of Narendra Modi and more importantly the value he places on India as a partner. Indeed, sure. Uh, Professor, you wanted to make a point. Uh, just two points on the excitement which Pakistan is showing on Trump conversation. Hmm. I think one is because uh, they feel a, a little comfort that in, in, in a period when they think they are getting isolated, there is somebody to say hello to them. And secondly, I think, uh, you know, in the long run, if uh, U.S.-Pakistan relationship warms up, if Pakistan is looking towards to forward to that, they'll have to carefully calculate what would be the reactions of the Chinese and the Russians, to whom which they have started warming up, Indeed. particularly China, because they have, the, the Chinese have put in a lot of stakes in Pakistan, and they would now not let Pakistan slip out of them. Indeed. Uh uh, Ambassador Kachu, do you see a lot of posturing in the coming days, you know, big players like China, America and uh, Russia jostling for position, some kind of position? 
No, I think uh, there will be a certain degree of caution uh, all across Asia and indeed in, in all parts of, of the world at what Trump will actually do. And caution need not translate into posturing. People uh, all across, uh, policy makers, will be looking for what uh, Trump actually means and what Trump will actually do. Uh, but uh, I, for one, as I said, I'll wait and watch because uh, all that my colleagues have said are largely true, but to an extent it's, it's largely speculative too. Because uh, Trump, the candidate, I uh, yes, he will be focused on things uh, relating to American domestic economic policy because after all that is the mandate which his constituency has given him. He needs to get some degree of manufacturing back. He needs to reinvigorate the American economy uh, because if he doesn't, uh, then his mandate will soon start withering away. But how he will translate all this, one doesn't know. Yes, a couple of things I'm, I'm actually quite certain about. And that is, as far as Pakistan is concerned, the Americans do realize, whether it's Trump or anyone else, that Pakistan's geographical location gives it a crucial role. And it has been a negative role as yet, as far as Afghanistan is concerned. And let us not forget that the National Security Advisor uh, who has been selected, uh, General Flynn, is a person with Afghanistan experience. So yes. I think there will be a focus on Afghanistan and whether that will mean that uh, the Americans want to pull out quickly, take the boys home, jeopardizing all that has happened in the last 15 years with the American project in Afghanistan because it has been a project or whether it means that they, they cannot take the risk of Afghanistan unraveling completely is something to be seen. But I for one feel that he will consolidate his position and he will deal with Pakistan firmly but cautiously. And all this, this conversation bit uh, is something which shouldn't be taken seriously at all. I mean, uh, it's Nawaz okay. Sharif and it's, as I said, it's, it's uh, I mean, to my mind, it's ludicrous. Uh, bringing out quotes of what uh, Donald Trump said and we know that Donald Trump has a certain idiom in which he expresses himself but how far but should that be taken seriously in Indeed. terms All of right. policy of course not uh, Mr. Bhushan, uh, let's let's take this discussion forward now and talk about India and where India really fits into the scheme of things as far as the US is concerned in this particular region well, uh, uh, U.S.-India uh, relationship will continue, I think, on a positive note because it's become a bipartisan relationship over time. You would have seen we did very well under the two uh, Bush administrations and subsequently the two democratic institutions, uh, presidencies, presidencies uh, yes. of uh, uh, President Bar Barack Obama. So I don't think India's position will change very much vis-a-vis -vis, um, the U.S. Where it will affect us would be in the economic sphere because uh, Donald Trump is an isolationist. He's a But he's got his interest in India too. He's got his interest in India too, but he's talked of uh, India ripping the U.S. off, taking away U.S. jobs. You would remember he mimicked uh, Indian call center work yes. uh, to suggest, uh, you know, what, what was happening when uh, U.S. outsources jobs. So if U.S. companies are unable to outsource to India or take Indian experts uh, to America, it's obviously going to affect uh, our interests. The U.S. Trade Representative's office has always protected American interests. Even during the previous administrations, we've been taken to the WTO by the USTR on uh, intellectual property rights issues, on domestic content, uh, on solar cell uh, projects, for example. So those things will continue. India's role in the region will depend on his policies towards China, whether he, uh, uh, as I said, if he works out good economic deals with them and frees them, uh, frees the strategic space in the region for uh, China by uh, diluting uh, his alliances with uh, South Korea and Japan. Then uh, the kind of role India had come to occupy to contain China uh, through uh, US pivot to Asia will also be affected uh, in a very big way. As far as Pakistan is concerned, please remember that you know we should not go only by the last statement of Trump. Trump has said about Pakistan that they are not our friends and he said they need to be checked and he would use India to check them. 
Now, to think that he will dump Pakistan completely would be uh, unreasonable and uh, unnecessarily hopeful. Pakistan is a nuclear state. It's too big a nuclear state to fail. America will not let that happen. So his engagement with Pakistan will continue. If he also has to push his agenda against terrorism, then he has to engage with Pakistan to contain terrorism because Pakistan has become the nursery of international terrorism yes, today. Yes. Mr. Ka uh, uh, Air Vice President, uh, how important really is Pakistan in terms of, you know, for the U.S.'s interests in the region as far as Afghanistan is concerned? You know, strategically, of course, Pakistan holds a lot of weight. No, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that Pakistan's locale, uh, in terms of uh, its being a neighbor of China in one way, China overall project in Pakistan, Pakistan's continuous involvement, negative one is that, in the manner in which Afghanistan pans out over the last decade and a half, it has its own importance. And I think, uh, I think Donald Trump will be partly candidate Trump and say Pakistan is not a state to be engaged. But in the context of the team when it forms up and the geopolitical and foreign policy realities he confronts because trump has no clue of foreign policy he's never shown any orientation towards larger issues of geopolitics in the world he's a out and out businessman how quickly he will grasp the realities like our own prime minister did he was a chief minister but as a chief minister he was briefed he learned the ropes when he was making his candidature for the prime minister. Whether Trump will follow the same example, I don't know. But I think Sherry Rahman, who's a former ambassador to the US and has very, very close linkages with the establishment in Pakistan, has gone on record to say that Pakistan-United States relations are going to be hugely challenged. Coming from her, it, it sort of gives us hope that Trump will not go the whole hog with Pakistan, in which case there will be an impact on relations with India. Although, as Bharat rightly said, these are bipartisan relations, especially Ashton Carter's visit, the Congress any day discussing and approving the defense appropriation bill in 2017, which allocates defense in the largest sphere. And there is a 2012 uh, note there which specifically applies to India. Declaration of India as a major defense partner with a directive. There's a Congress directive. Oh, no, it's very unlikely P uh, President Trump will go against it. Directing the defense secretary and the secretary of state to ensure that the relationship with India in terms of technology transfer, in terms of the strategic elements of that relationship are brought forward and All right. kept in that loop. I'd like to Professor, lastly mention yeah. in the context of Trump and India, you know the four foundational agreements. Uh, we have somehow managed to raise a lot of dust rather than light in those foundational agreements. The most intrusive of them we have already signed. That is the end user agreement. I don't know why there is so much noise about the LEMOA, which is a, uh, you know, a substitute, India-specific substitute for the logistics supplier. It is not, I mean, it's been made out that this is a reflective of an alliance. It just is not that. Basically, it takes care of exercises, takes care of training, and takes care of uh, utilization of each other's logistics without having to go through right. repayment and three forms being filled in South Block before you provide a facility. And we need to understand that agreement also caters for an exit clause. And if the US at any time uh, uses military force against a friend of India, India can exit that agreement. Okay, fair enough. I've, I've got two minutes on the program, so I'd like to get everyone's views into, in, into the picture. Professor Munil, you know, uh, as far as Putin is concerned. We've not really spoken about Vladimir Putin in the scheme of things because everything seems to be going his way at the moment because Trump has won. Uh, Francois Fillon seems to be doing extremely well yes. in France. Uh, Angela Merkel's uh, ratings are going down to the dump. So clearly everything seems to be working in Trump's favor. So should we start uh, in, in favor of Vladimir Putin, I beg your pardon. So should we start looking towards Russia now? 
Well, we have always been looking towards Russia. But over the and last two and a half years, there has been a well, shift towards the U.S. No, I think what is happening is that the Russia is diversifying its relations and largely driven by the economic necessities, which is quite understandable. And that is one reason why they are even started. They even started looking towards Pakistan for selling goodies here and there. Yes, there may be uh, some sort of a Chinese uh, influence or push or whatever you call it, but that's not going to weigh very heavily on um, Vladimir uh, Putin in any case, because he, uh, he is also fixated with the idea of making Russia great, like uh, Trump is, uh, you know, uh, being driven by America first. So I think uh, we, we must uh, further reinforce relations with Russia, I have absolutely no doubt and should not do anything which dilutes that uh, strategic core relationship. Indeed. And uh, Ambassador Kachu, uh, final comments from you as well, because I've got just one minute left on the program, so if you could quickly sum it up for us. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think as far as the India-US relationship is concerned, it will move ahead strongly. Yes, there will be blips in immigration and other issues. But uh, a couple of things. One, uh, we've got to look at our options uh, all over while retaining our autonomy of action. I think that is a significant uh, part. And as far as China are con is concerned, I for one don't see how we cannot uh, try to handle China uh, without building our, our relationships uh, with the U.S., and other partners, the U.S. Uh, is, of course, still a superpower, is and will remain a superpower. It's our relationship with them and with other partners in Asia. And I think we can do all this while retaining our autonomy of action. And uh, Mr. Bhushan, finally, one last question is, does India still have the clout as far as influencing Western powers is concerned? Do we, can we, are we still good influencers? We are the largest uh, uh, sort of uh, growth engine after China. Uh, economic growth has moved to the east. We've got a huge market. Everybody wants market access. Yes, India has a lot of influence. But Donald Trump is a disruptor. Disruptors are often very good for the world because I think we will see changes not only in West Asia, but also in this region. And we'll have to think uh, anew about how to deal with him. To think that Trump is going to do exactly what a democratic administration would have done is a big mistake. Because if people wanted to vote, vote for status quo, they would not have voted for him. So I think candidate Trump's statements really need to be taken seriously. They may get diluted 10%, 20%. But that's the direction he's going to move in. All right. On that note, we'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. We're completely out of time. Bharat Bhushan, Professor S.T. Muni, Vivek Karchu and Kapil Kak, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with me on this edition of The Big Picture and putting things into perspective for us. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching.